Amen. You may be seated, friends. In just a few minutes, our, our ushers will be coming around to receive our Connect cards and our offering. Uh, so if you haven't filled out your cards, now would be the time to do that. I want to welcome you to Stillwater. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, we're just honored to get to worship Jesus here with you today. A um, couple things before the offering comes around, though, I wanted to share with you. Uh, the first is I want to introduce you to some new friends of mine. Uh, this is uh, Brady and Abby Feltz on the screen in just a moment here. Uh, Brady and Abby, you might wonder why. I'm introducing you to them. Well, the reason is because Brady is our new associate pastor at Stillwater Church as of this summer. So that's exciting, right? I'm excited about that. Brady will be our, our, our associate pastor who oversees uh, outreach ministries at Stillwater Church and who oversees our Y campus. And uh, so you'll be getting to know the two of the, uh, these two. Uh, they are great folks. In fact, Abby is actually going to be starting seminary here at United Theological Seminary. Uh, so they're kind of a, a pastoral couple in the making. And uh, they've been married for a little over a year. Uh, we'll be sharing with you uh, more info. Watch your e-news. Uh, you'll see uh, links to uh, Brady's Facebook page, to his blog, uh, just some ways you can get, get to know him. And uh, be sure, if you're on social media, to welcome him to Stillwater Church or welcome them to Stillwater Church. Uh, we are just very excited about this. Uh, so that'll be happening the last weekend in June. So a little bit of advanced warning, but uh, we just uh, got that all figured out this past week. Also, um, I wanted to show you a picture that you might be familiar with this structure. Anybody recognize that? It used to be in our parking lot, right? Yep, that's cool. That is the structure that we framed right out here in our parking lot. Uh, there's a little bit more of a close-up. And then here's the finished product right here. Uh, it looks pretty good, doesn't it? God is good. But best of all, uh, we've got a family here that we want to show you. Here they are with their new home. Um, you see the three, there's the three daughters there. And uh, this is the first home uh, that this family has ever been able to purchase. Uh, remember that they purchased the home at a greatly reduced price, uh, but they have a lot of uh, financial equity and sweat equity into it, as do we as a church and many others who partnered together to build this great house. And uh, but prior to this, uh, they, had, they had only been able to live uh, in uh, government housing in an area that wasn't the safest area of town. And uh, one of the things that they wrote to us is one of the little daughters said, I was so thankful that for the first night we stayed in our home because I didn't have to feel scared at night. I thought that was a pretty cool uh, reminder of how good God is. And I'm so thankful for each of you. You know, when you give financially here, when you give your time and your talents, God uses it to build his kingdom uh, in ways that are much bigger than what you and I will ever see. God is truly changing lives around the world. And finally, uh, Ash Wednesday was this past week. We had a great service here, and that's when we began the Lenten season together. The season of Lent is the season that we uh, look forward to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And during the season of Lent, uh, many of us choose to to fast from something, to give something up, or else to give a little bit extra financially um, as, a, as kind of just a sacrificial thing to, as a way of worshiping Jesus. Um, if you want to participate with that, we have this basket down front, and 100% of this goes to our partner church in Cuba, where God uses it to do great things there, to feed the hungry, and to build their ministries. Uh, some of us choose to give up desserts or coffee or alcohol or movies or something like that. Others just choose to give a little extra. If you want to do that, you're welcome to participate. Uh, when we're receiving offerings or before or after the service, you can always uh, drop, the, drop that extra money into here if you wish to do that. So our ushers are going to come around to receive our Connect cards and our offering. Uh, once they finish, we're actually going to stay seated for our song today. sweet the sound Amazing love Now flowing down From hands and feet That were nailed to the tree His grace flows down and covers me Amazing grace, how 
how sweet the sound Amazing love Now flowing down From hands and feet That were nailed to the tree His grace flows down and covers me Covers me It covers me It covers me It covers me grace how sweet the sound amazing love now flowing down from hands and feet that were nailed to the tree his grace flows down and covers me covers me it covers me it covers me as we begin this season of Lent, we, it's a time that we're journey, journeying towards the cross, towards ultimately the grave and resurrection. It's a time when we put a special focus on Jesus Christ, the, the author, the perfecter of our faith, our ultimate example in faith who has shown us the way to do this. And, and we often talk about receiving the love of Jesus, and that's great. Uh, but we also need to love like Jesus loved. And so we're going to study his life, uh, several things, aspects of his life uh, that showed us uh, specifically how he loved. And we're going to see how we can replicate those things in our lives. We're going to find that these are high standards. Jesus did not set low standards for us. Clearly, his standard was that we would be holy as God is holy. And so we're going to look at how we can live uh, in those ways. Today, we're going to kick it off by talking about how we might forgive as Jesus forgave. Forgiveness is tough. It's really difficult. We all know that we need to forgive. We all know that we should do that. But yet, practically speaking, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. Because we've all been hurt in a variety of ways. And we, we hold these things in sometimes. And, they can, and this, this unforgiveness, this bitterness, it can mess us up inside. It can make for a whole lot of problems, relationally, spiritually, all of these kinds of things. Some folks just don't, it just doesn't feel like they deserve to be forgiven though, right? Some things just seem so bad, so wrong, that it just seems virtually unforgivable. I remember I, I met a person once who had encountered things that were so difficult that seemed this way. 
it was late in my time in, in seminary, pastor school, right? And so at the, towards the end of this, that we have uh, something uh, called clinical pastoral education, which is kind of like our version of a residency that a doctor would do. And we go either to a hospital to be a chaplain there or to uh, where I went was hospice, uh, which is an organization that works with folks who are in their last six months of living. They, they know that they're terminally ill. And it's, it was really a difficult, challenging time, of course, because you're, you're continually surrounded by death and these things. But much more so than that, it's in a very supervised environment. And the purpose of it is that as students, they would, they would poke at us and prod us in all sorts of ways to, to help us to learn and to grow. One of the ways that we would do this is when we'd go visit with folks, uh, we would have to write down verbatim the things they said, the things we said. And then our supervisor would meet with us and would, would look at everything we said and, and always be questioning, like, why'd you say this? Why didn't you say that? They wanted to go here, but you went there. What was up with that? And you're like, I don't know. I just said it, right? I'm, I'm not really sure. And, and it gets uncomfortable. There's a lot of poking and prodding. It's, it's like an emotional colonoscopy, right? That's probably the best description. It's about as much fun as that sounds, right? And it's very painful and in-depth at times because you're, you're digging into layers of yourself that you don't often pay attention to. And the two most difficult times of the week we're, we're definitely not meeting with patients. That was the best time. The, the most difficult times were first our one-on-one -on -one with our supervisor where she would just dig and dig and dig at things. But the second was a time called IPR. And this was a weekly meeting that, that our team had. There was, our team was just four of us. And there was myself. There was another guy who was very much like myself, similar age, all that stuff. Uh, there was a third person. She was about 60. She had finished her career. Uh, she wasn't looking to go on to be a pastor or a chaplain. She was doing this actually just for her own personal growth, which also means she was probably crazy, I think, because I don't know why you put yourself through that just for fun, but she did. And the fourth person, the one I want to talk about here, was Judy. Judy was a Catholic sister, about a decade older than, than I was at the time. Uh, Judy was a very nice person, just kind of a, an odd person, right? She just kind of struggled to connect with folks. And one of the things that Judy would do would be that when we would have like really serious, deep, deep conversations about painful stuff, there sometimes would be a little pause. You know how that is. And during these pauses, instead of being silent, Judy would just start laughing. And it wasn't like an authentic laugh. It was like just a very awkward laugh. In fact, I, I found probably the closest version of it I could find online, and we got a video of this. Here's about what it sounded like. <laughs> that is the hyenas laughing, not the girl, by the way. Okay, so we'd get in these deep, serious, painful moments, and she'd start doing this hyena laugh, and it would get on my nerves. I don't know if it would get on your nerves, but it got on my nerves, right? And I, I remember talking a little bit with the supervisor about it, not really that much. And then one day, it happened that we were in this IPR meeting, and that stands for Interpersonal Relationships. And I remember we had the first one of these, and our supervisor starts it off. It's just the five of us in the room, and she says... This is IPR. For the next hour, we will talk about our relationships with one another. And that's it. Now, I don't know about you, but that does not sound like fun to me, right? For, for some people, like for Judy, this was incredibly fun, right? And so she talked most all the whole time, right? So the rest of us just sat back like, okay, this is easier, right? But Judy began to tell these stories. And they were painful, difficult stories about her father, grow, I should say her father growing up, because this man hardly deserved the title of father. Her, 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 her dad was someone who treated all his children just, just atrociously. Uh, he wouldn't work. He didn't provide for them. Uh, he was very lazy, intentionally lazy. Uh, he was someone who would abuse them in every way imaginable. Just an awful, awful person. He was, quite frankly, it would be better to call him a sperm donor than a father because he did not contribute to the life of his kids in any positive way. And he, she would tell these stories and, and they were so difficult to hear. I just, 
I, I remember just feeling anger just welling up inside of me towards this man, who I don't even know this guy, right? But I just feel this anger coming up because my wife was pregnant with our first child at the time, and I was connecting with this stuff, and it, and it just irritated me so much. And she was telling once this story in this IPR meeting about how she, she figured something out about her dad as she got a little older, that he had a pattern that he would go out drinking at night and he would come home very late, the middle of the night, and just, just drunk as could be, and he would come to her room and he would molest her. And Judy figured something out. They had in their house, they had a spiral staircase that led up to the attic. And she found that if she would climb up this staircase and take her pillow and her blanket, and she would sleep in the attic, that when her dad came home, that he would try to climb the stairs, but he couldn't make it. He'd be so drunk, he'd pass out drunk on the stairs, and he couldn't hurt her. And I remember hearing this story and feeling so angry, so deeply angry. And our supervisor could tell that I was feeling angry. And she said, well, John, how do you feel about this? And I was so angry. I, I just felt like I couldn't say anything because I was afraid I would say the wrong thing, something so hurtful to her. And I, and I paused, and she did that laugh, and then that just made me even feel more angry about the situation. And I said, I feel sad. She said, okay, how else do you feel? I was like, I feel sad. And that's all, that's all I could bring myself to say. I thought I'd gotten out of that moment, but then when we later had our one-on-one -on -one meeting, she started poking at me more, as you'd imagine she would. She's like, I think you felt more than sad. What else did you feel? And, and I, I said, I felt mad. And she kept poking and poking. And, and finally, I just lost it. I was so angry. This man that I've never met probably will never met. And I remember, I remember just exploding and just saying, I hate her father. I can't stand that guy. I can't stand the stories about him. He's not a dad. He shouldn't ever have been able to have kids. He's evil. It's wrong. Who in the world would ever bring children into the world and do that to them? There's no excuse for that. And tears were just running down my face. I was just so angry. And it hit me that forgiveness is so hard. If I, who's not the one violated in this situation, was struggling so hard to forgive, how much harder is it to forgive if you're Judy? And some of you are Judy, and you know what that's like. Others of you, you've been through situations like this. You've been hurt so bad in so many ways. And for others, maybe it's not something of that kind of magnitude, but there's so many things that cause hurt and pain in our life. The day in, day out, the person that you just, they just get on your nerves and they just know it and it seems like they're always poking at you and always making life difficult for you. And we struggle to forgive. It's one of the greatest struggles of being human. And so we look at Jesus Christ, say, okay, I'm called to love like Jesus. What does that look like? How would I forgive like Jesus? Well, friends, let me tell you, he sets the bar really, really high. So be ready. Matthew 6, 14, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Ouch. That's, if that doesn't make you squirm a little, you're not paying attention. Because friends, all of us, I'm betting, have struggled to forgive at one point or another. In fact, I would bet the majority of us could have a face in our mind right now of somebody or somebody's that we are struggling to forgive. We know what this is like. We know what this is like. And we want to say, how on earth are we supposed to forgive these people? I don't want to forgive Judy's stupid dad. I don't want to forgive that kind of stuff. It's not in my nature to want to do that because it just is so wrong. How do you forgive someone things that seem so unforgivable? Well, Jesus' standards were not just philosophical standards for him. No, these are things that Jesus literally lived out in his life. He lived them out in ways bigger than, than I could ever live them out. We see it in many times in Jesus' life, but I want to look at one from the end of Luke. It's where Jesus is being crucified. Luke 23, 32. Two others, both criminals, 
were led out to be executed with him. When they came to the place called the skull, they nailed him on the cross. And two criminals were also crucified, one on his right, one on his left. Now, I won't today go into all the, the details of this. Crucifixion is just an awful, awful way to die. In fact, the word excruciating comes from this word for crucifixion. Just the most excruciating death a person could ever imagine. And one thing about it, there's, there's some myths that we get, or some misunderstandings, I should say, that we get uh, just from historical artwork, because there's a lot of Christian artwork that it gives us very sanitized versions of the cross, because the real thing would have been so horrific, you wouldn't want to look at it. And one of the things that they, that they change is that they elevate the cross substantially, probably even higher than ours in a lot of this artwork. And so the crucified victims are, are way up in the air, where in reality, most historians agree that, that Roman crucifixions were done quite low to the ground. In fact, if this was the ground, people were usually crucified about this high up. So they're here on the cross, and people are here right in front of them. And there's a purpose for this. The reason is so that others can come by and they can mock you. They can spit upon you. They can insult you. When you're in your place of hopeless torture leading to death, that you can get one more set of rejection from humanity. It's such a, a painful thing. And so Jesus is here on the cross and those people who he is dying for, who he's dying to give his life for, are there. And they're up to him face to face saying, Hail, King of the Jews. He saved others, but he can't save himself. They're mocking him. It's about the greatest irony one could imagine. The, the one who is literally giving their, his life for their sins, they are sinning by mocking him. If ever there's a cause for not wanting to forgive, you would think it would be this one. You would think that Jesus would easily say, you know what, I'm giving my life for everybody except that guy right there. He definitely doesn't get it. He definitely doesn't deserve it. But is this Jesus' response? No, not at all. Instead, he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. It's the kind of forgiveness that, that seems unimaginable. Forgiving as he's being sinned against. Forgiving people who are clearly not sorry. They're actively doing the sin at the moment. This is a hard standard. It really is. If you live long enough, you're going to be hurt by people over and over and over. Maybe it's mom or dad. Maybe it's a boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, a spouse, an ex, uh, your children, your boss, your coworker, the company that let you go unfairly, the, the people who gossip with you or gossiped about you, people who lied about you, people who hurt, who hurt you in just unspeakable ways. You might find yourself even mad sometimes not forgiving towards God. Because sometimes we have anger towards God, and it's fair to be angry with God. There's, it's okay. But, but it's bad when we get stuck in a position of unforgiveness. Why didn't God do something? Why didn't God stop? There's, stop these things. There's not always easy answers, right, friends? Because God gives people free will, and I like free will a lot when I'm getting to use it in my own life, but I hate it when other people use it badly against me. Unforgiveness is, is, is tough. And sometimes we struggle to forgive the one who may be the least forgivable in our lives, and that's our own self. Because we know what we've done. Others may not know, but we certainly know. And even though we know conceptually God's forgiven and others have forgiven, it's so, so difficult. How on earth are we supposed to forgive like Jesus forgave? Well, Jesus gives us a, a couple of steps that I want to look at. There are two steps that are very simple to state and very challenging to live out. But my friends, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you can and you will forgive others if you do these things on an ongoing basis in your life. You can find freedom. You may have been chained up for years by bitterness, pent-up anger, and unforgiveness, 
Friends, I want to extend healing to you in the name of Jesus Christ. The first thing that Jesus did, how do we forgive like Jesus? First, you pray for those who hurt you. Pray for those who hurt you. And maybe you're saying, huh, a pastor thinks I should pray. Shocking, right? This is amazing, right? But seriously, this is an essential step because God does incredible things when we pray. God changes others. God changes us. God calls us to do this. Luke 6, 28, Jesus says this, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. Let's be honest, this is hard, right? I mean, some of us are here saying like, hey, you know, I'll pray for them, all right. <laughs> I'll pray that they get poison ivy and hemorrhoids and poison ivy on their hemorrhoids. That, okay, too far, maybe too far, I don't know. I'll pray, God. God, here's my prayer. You judge them, you send them to hell. I did my part, you do yours. Sometimes that's how we feel, but these are not the prayers that Jesus is referring to. No, it's a different kind of prayer. This may be, these may be the toughest prayers you ever pray. And it may begin, you may say, I don't know what I could pray that would be good for this person. If nothing else, why don't you start by saying, God, please do something in their life. Start there. And don't add the asterisk that says something terrible, okay? Just do something. We'll assume, God does good things, so let's assume it'll be good, right? Then we take it to another level. We say, God, please help them to see their need for you. Please help them. We say, hurting people hurt people, right? They need healing as well. They need healing as well. Please help them. And you really know that you're starting to get somewhere in your heart and mind when you're able to pray and say, God, would you please bless them? This may seem counterintuitive because you set out just to want revenge, but what you find is as you begin to pray, God works. God begins to change your heart. And he begins to give you the ability to do things you didn't think you could do before. Like Jesus was talking once about enemies, right? He said in Matthew 5, 43, you've heard that the Jewish law says, love your neighbor, that was the law. And then people would add, hate your enemy, right? You love your neighbor, but, but enemies, whatever. Don't worry about them. But Jesus said, I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. These go hand in hand. You don't love your enemies if you're not praying for them, okay? Because you're not likely to do this on your own strength. You need to pray that God will give you the strength to love your enemies, to forgive, to pray for those who persecute you. We ask God, would you give us the strength to do this? When Jesus said these words, I know that we get familiar with them because we go to church. Maybe, maybe you've been around church for a while and you've heard this stuff before. You've heard, love your enemies. But think about how shocking this would have been. I mean, Jesus' original audience there, you have the Jewish folks who were taught the law of Moses, which said, an eye for an eye, okay? Just equal retaliation, which when Moses gave that law, that was really a restrictive law because Moses was in a culture where it was more like, you, you, you hit me in the eye, I'll mess up your whole face, right? It's, it's not equal retaliation. We'll step it up, right? You hurt my child, I'll take out your whole family. That was their kind of retaliation. And Moses said, nope, nope, it's going to be equivalent. Okay, Jesus says, that's what you've heard. <laughs> Let me tell you how my followers live. Here's how my followers live. When somebody slaps them on one cheek, they turn the others. They, they love their enemies. While the world hates their enemies, they bring love to this to the uh, Jewish folks, that would have seemed tough. To the Romans, it would have just seemed outright ludicrous. For the Romans, they even had a goddess of revenge. This is how much Romans value revenge. You are revenge. You, you pray to, to Invicticus here, the goddess of revenge. You see, she's got the, uh, the sword, right? She's ready to act out vengeance. And she's got the hourglass. Just wait. She's coming for you, right? The, the Greeks... 
they had their own version of this goddess. Her name was Nemesis, right? We talk about an arch nemesis, right? That's where the term comes from. So they thought not only that revenge was important, they kind of deified it, right? It's, it's like a god to them. So if when Jesus says, love your enemies, people are like, are you kidding me? How do you expect that to work out in the real world, Jesus? This, this is not the way that we operate, we want to love our enemies, we're going to need to pray. Because when we pray, things begin to change. And I want to be able to tell you that your enemies will change and they'll come around and they'll be great. And maybe they will, but maybe they won't. What I can tell you for sure is that your prayer, <laughs> your prayer for others may or may not change them but it will always change you. Your prayer for others, it may or may not change them, but it will change you. It's really hard to hate someone when you're praying that God will bless them. This may take some time. Every time those feelings of bitterness, unforgiveness, hate seep into your life, you're gonna say, God, do something for that person. Do something good. Bless them. Help me to learn to forgive. And if your next thought of unforgiveness comes 30 seconds later, you're going to pray it again and pray it again. And maybe a daily routine for you, maybe an ongoing thing. It may take, it will take days, weeks, maybe months. Maybe you've been holding this in for years. It's going to take some time. It may take the help of a counselor. It may take the accountability of your community group or a friend. Do it. Do it. Be courageous to love like Jesus loved. And that begins with praying for our enemies. The second thing we do, we pray for them. And second, we forgive as we have been forgiven. If you thought prayer was tough, well, it's going to get tougher here. You need to pray first, okay? Because this is really tough. We forgive as we have been forgiven. Colossians 3.13, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Now, this is not the world's standard. The world's standard is forgive those who are sorry, forgive those who have made things right, or maybe forgive after you've gotten your retaliation. This is the world's standard of forgiveness. And Jesus says, Nope, nope, not how it is for us. Not how it is for us as followers of Jesus. Instead, we forgive because we have been forgiven. Suddenly the standard is not others. Now, I don't know about you. I can only speak for me, but I know God has forgiven me of a lot. A lot. I'm guessing others would agree on that. If you really look honestly at yourself, God has probably forgiven a lot in your life. So that means I'm called also to be very generous in my forgiveness of others because I'm thankful that God didn't give me all the stuff I deserve. Are you? <laughs> so if God didn't give me what I deserve, then who am I to try to en enact revenge on everybody else? Because... God is the one who never sinned. I've sinned plenty of times, countless times. If God chose to forgive me as an act of grace and love, so that's how I'm called to forgive others. We as Christians should be the best forgivers in the whole world. We should be. Because our, we're not doing it so much for them, we're doing it for Jesus. Look, you're not forgiving people because they're sorry. They may never, ever be sorry. I hope they are. I really do. But they may not be. We don't forgive others because somehow they try to make it right. They may never do that. Look, if, if you're holding unforgiveness and you're saying, I'll forgive when that person is sorry, guess what? You just gave all the cards to your enemy. So now you're stuck. You're going to be bitter. You're going to be angry. Your life is going to be a whole lot less good than what it could be. And you have given all the power to your enemy because you can't forgive unless they come around and make things right. Good luck. 
It's not likely to happen, my friends. Sometimes it does, but often it just doesn't. It just doesn't. Jesus knew what he was talking about here. We don't forgive because they're sorry. We don't forgive because they're worthy, because they probably won't be able to be worthy of it. The nature of sin is that we can't just counterbalance it with other good things. We can do good things, but that still doesn't change the fact that we were sinned against, right? We're still, these sins are still there. And you might say, well, well, I don't want to forgive because the other person doesn't deserve it. Of course they don't deserve it. Neither did you. Neither did I. And so that is my standard now. I forgive as I've been forgiven. It may sound a little crazy, but but seriously, what's, what's the alternative? To live in bitterness, unforgiveness, always mad, laying up at three, 3 o'clock in the morning, right? Thinking about how mad you are at that person, thinking about all the things you want to do to that person, thinking about all the hurt they caused, all the pain they caused. While you're doing that, you know what the other person's doing? Sleeping, okay? It's, it's not, you're not getting even with them by being bitter, You're not hurting them by being bitter. You're hurting yourself. So you can harbor this unforgiveness. I'm I'm going to be bitter. I'm going to be mad. I'm going to be the, the best in the world at being bitter and angry, right? That's not a real accomplishment. Some of us have tried for years and years and years. How's that working out for you? I sound like Dr. Phil. I know. Sorry. But, but <laughs> seriously, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Jesus' way is so much better here. Author Anne Lamott said it this way, bitterness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. It just doesn't work that way, friends. When we forgive, we have a number of reasons we should do it. The number one, and really the only one we need, is because Jesus did it for us and he commanded us to do it. That should be good enough for us because we say Jesus is Lord. That means that I want to forgive like he forgave. As difficult as it is, I'm going to continually pray. I'm going to continually forgive over and over and over. And if I have to say that for weeks, months, and years, I'm going to keep on saying it. God, I choose to forgive this day. Help my unforgiveness. I'm going to pray for my enemies. I'm going to pray for those who who have hurt me. And so when we do that, over and over and over. What we find is that God changes us through our prayers, through our ongoing effort, most of all through the power of his Holy Spirit, and we eventually are able to to, to make this decision. It's an ongoing thing. Look, if if you're here and you're, you're holding in bitterness and anger, and you're sitting here waiting for the day that, that you wake up and it's a sunny day, the birds are singing, there's a rainbow over your house, there's unicorns running around, and you say, I'm just going to forgive today. It ain't going to happen. We don't, that's not how we work. When we hold in bitterness, we make it worse, not better. There's got to be the day where we break out the frozen CD, we say, I'm going to let it go, and I'm going to give this to God, because He forgave me. And that's the reason. That's the best reason I could ever forgive. I read a story of a man who they had suffered something terrible in their family. It was many years before. They didn't know about it, but, but one of the girls in their family had been molested by a, a school teacher uh, for an ongoing period of time. She had been so scared, she wasn't able to tell the family until adulthood. It was, it was past the statute of limitations. They couldn't prosecute. They felt so hopeless, so angry, so justifiably bitter and mad. And who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? They lived in this for a time. And eventually they made a choice, a very radical choice. They decided, they decided to look at how Jesus forgave them. And so they wrote a letter. They wrote a letter to the abuser. They said, we know what you did to our daughter, to our sister. You've caused so much pain and hurt in our lives. We're very angry about that. But we want you to know 
that as followers of Jesus, we are choosing to forgive you because we recognize that we've also done our own set of wrong things in life, and Jesus forgave us. And furthermore, we're going to pray that you would find forgiveness from Jesus in your own life. They sent that letter to the man. A while later, through circumstances that would seem like a coincidence, but I'm pretty sure God was involved, they would meet a person who was actually the hospice nurse for this man. He had only weeks to live at this point. And he was in such bad shape, he couldn't read the letter. But the nurse opened his mail and saw it, and she thought she didn't know all the story, but thought that she should read it to him. As she read him the letter, tears flowed down the man's face. She finished, and he said, please, read it again. Read it again. And he heard over and over the story of how a family who has no earthly reason to forgive chose to forgive because they had encountered the forgiveness of their God who had forgiven them. And that day the man prayed, and he asked Jesus into his life. But I like what the author of the letter said. He said, the day I let it go was the day that God set a prisoner free. That prisoner was me. I'm thankful that the man found Jesus. I'm thankful for grace. I'm also thankful that the family was set free. Because I can't imagine much worse than going through that, but if you want to add insult to injury, just harbor bitterness the rest of your life. Because then you put that, that person in the position to hurt you every single day. Friends, I would encourage you instead to take the route of Christ. The route of authentic forgiveness. Because that's how God forgave you. God, we're going to need your help. If we're going to forgive like this, it's not going to be our strength, God. It's going to be yours and yours alone that empowers us to forgive those who have hurt us. Some of us have years of bitterness stuffed down inside. Anger, tears, sleepless nights, hateful words, thoughts, threats, whatever. God, would you give us the courage to turn those things over to you? to lay them on your altar, to remember that somehow you chose to forgive us even before we could ever say sorry. And that today you forgive us for absolutely everything that we have done, that in the name of Jesus Christ, we can be forgiven. Thank you, God, that we can give our lives to you to experience your forgiveness. Lord, I pray for anybody who's not made that choice. May today be the day that we say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me all my sins. Wash me white as snow. Heal me. Cleanse me. For those of us who are struggling to forgive others, would you just give us a reminder, Lord Jesus, of how great your forgiveness is? Would you help us to pray for those who have hurt us and to forgive as you have forgiven us? God, thanks for your forgiveness. Help us to go and do likewise. Lord, we love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.